Yeah. Now, I always insist, well, if possible, that people should remove themselves from their environment, whether it's a holiday, to even if it's just outside your community, outside your town, outside your district or whatever. So you see things differently. Yeah. And uh, you kind of mentioned that when you were shocked by looking at women empowerment, where yeah. you are, and here in Uganda, because a lot of the times we think things on the ground here are yeah. the worst <laughs> possibly they could be. And then you go somewhere else and you're like, eh, yeah. we've actually done all right. <laughs> we have a lot more to yes. do. Yes. So, I mean, you mentioned that like they're like 20 years behind yeah. us yeah. here in Uganda. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be honest, like, um, at least in the environments that have worked in, what I've witnessed, is that uh, when you come to Uganda, Uganda is one of those countries that was privileged or lucky to have had one of the first strong women movements, mm -hmm. okay? And in other countries, these, they're just struggling to even get the women movement to the ground to start this. Uh, we, I can't, you know, mention all the successes we've had in terms of women leadership, you know, up to the level of the, uh, you know, the executive in the government. Mm -hmm up to the level of parliament, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the local councils or the district uh, uh, leadership and all that. And we, I believe that we have the right infrastructure in place. We've come a long way and this is the right time for us to be able to use this infrastructure to do the right thing. One thing I always say to my friends in Uganda is that, look, women don't just need representation because mm -hmm. sometimes when we talk about women movement in uganda we think oh we need you know um we need a, a, a woman member of parliament you know next yeah. to a man in for each uh, constituency we need a, a youth woman you know member of parliament or whatever mm. we don't need a representation for the women we need women to actually be at the table in terms of decisions, decisions being made, the power to the, make the, decisions. the, the decision being made for them, by them, and involving them. All right. Even if you had a man go and talk about women issues, that would be much more influential. If actually this is getting out there, and you're actually seeing changes, you're seeing policies change, you're seeing investments increasing in their lives, than when we just say let's just push numbers of women up yeah. there, because we risk that being tokenism. Mm -hmm. And just saying, oh, we just have. Oh, what are you talking about? Women empowerment? Yeah, we have women members of parliament. But, but are they actually making a difference? That's Do the they gap. actually have a voice? Exactly. Mm. That's, that's the gap. So you, we have moved to that level where we're now talking about changing from just women representation, but actually operationalizing all the good policies we have in this country to get the services to the people. Mm -hmm. And other countries haven't even reached that level, where I have at least gone. I'm not talking about the developed countries. Yeah. I'm talking about the, the, you know, the economies that are just coming up. They haven't reached that level, you know. When I see how much women are empowered in this country, mm -hmm. we're so lucky. And we just have every right ingredient, ingredient in its place to mm -hmm. just make sure that we now get to do the real work, get services there. Unfortunately, some of the women leaders that we have are not doing that. You know, they're not actually doing that. Mm -hmm. But in this reality, what we need is getting services closer to women, addressing their needs, yeah. participatory mm -hmm learning and appraisal where we talk to women to understand their problems talk to them to provide their solutions mm -hmm. sometimes we think we know what they want <laughs> yes. wrong assumption yeah most times in communities when there are problems mm. they already have solutions they have their own ideas this is how we come around this um i'll give you an example in in liberia when we had ebola we were struggling to find out what works what doesn't work in one of the counties called Lofa County, mm. the community came up with their own system to quarantine and make sure that people don't come into contact with potential cases of Ebola. Okay. And they had this, like the community policing, they would go house to house, investigate who's new in this house, where are you from, take them out. And we started seeing a reduction. It was one of the highest, hardest hit counties because it was bordered with Guinea. Yes. But then we started seeing a reduction when we get situation reports every day in the cases coming from that county. Because the action was on community level. Community level. Mm -hmm. Without our millions of dollars that came from all these donors, we started seeing results in this small place, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that to me told me that, look, the solutions don't have to come from people with PhDs mm -hmm. in doing this kind of work. No, they are homebred solutions. Go to the women, ask them what is wrong. Yeah. What do you think we should do? Mm -hmm. Help them do that. Yeah. Empower them. Don't spoon feed them. Empower them to do what they think they can do to get themselves out of that situation. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, last year I was, I was privileged to do quite a lot of work with a girl child. Yeah. And um, in Uganda, we have so many programs empowering the girl child. But one of the things I noticed was a shift, which I think is kind of what you're talking about even in the policies yeah. uh, that you work with. Uh, there was a shift where a lot of people are saying, much as we're empowering the girl child, what are we doing for the boy child as yeah. well? Yeah. Um, a lot of people feel that, you know, these conversations should also be had with boys because we're raising, as you said, a new generation yeah. where young women are going to know their rights yeah. and we're going to do things differently. But are we raising young men to be able to also respond differently mm -hmm. and understand the new dynamic in terms of what our society is yeah. heading to. Yeah. So, I mean, you are a father yeah. of two boys and a girl. Yes. yes. I, two girls and a boy. <laughs> and a lot of people are saying, but our boys, our yeah. boys, yeah. our boys, we're telling our girls this, that, yeah. the other. But yeah. what about the boys? Do you feel that there's a gap there as well? It is a huge gap. Uh, personally, I, I had this conversation with I, my friends, you know, male friends, and uh, for quite some time I have experienced it in my work, and I, I know it's a huge gap that exists. Mm. Um, boys, unfortunately, don't we don't look at them as being vulnerable. That's the thing. They're like they yeah, do, they'll figure it out. They'll they figure know. It out. And this is to you as well. You it, may be it, a mother, father of boys, or in future you will be. This yeah, is important. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes even you know, just on the lighter side of it, when you get a boy, you're like, oh, okay, I'm not going to worry about now getting someone, you know, getting my kid pregnant. I have boys, and uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> on the lighter side. But yeah, yeah. On a more serious <laughs> note, uh, boys have not been uh, prepared on how to deal with the issues of growing up and you know responsibility and unfortunately we've also as fathers given this role mostly to mothers to do now by design mothers are not engineered to prepare boys to become men yeah you it's, cannot it's, a woman exactly. cannot teach a boy to be a man exactly mm -hmm. uh it's it's fathers that have the key responsibility uh, the way a father would raise a son is different from the way a mother would. Because I'll, for instance, with my kids, I'm much harder with my boys because I don't expect the world to be soft on them. So I'll be much hard on them. Their mother, on the other hand, will be soft on them, yeah. which is not what would get them into the world. For me, it's about accountability, responsibility, you know. So um, I, I, I believe that um, a lot should be done, a lot more could be done and we shouldn't think that someone else should come and do this for our own boys and children but it should be us my simple advice to most uh, fathers I know it's a difficult thing to do is or uncles or, uncles, or grandfathers exactly mm. is first and foremost these boys need identity one as they grow up and go through uh, the transition from puberty to adolescence they look at you know men around them as figures My father is a hero, but as they go into the teens, they realize, okay, my father is just a human like any other person. He makes mistakes. Mm. But through this time, your son doesn't know why you make mistakes. If you're not careful and he continues saying these mistakes, he, he's, he then, as he becomes a young man, he starts to despise you because you have not connected the friendship. Right. I, with my sons, for instance, in their puberty, I've talked to them and prepared them about growing up and the challenges of adolescence, mm -hmm. right from everything about respect about women, about uh, people, humility, about discipline, about sexuality, relationships, Accountability. everything. Accountability. <laughs> now, now they're in their teens, 
the conversation is about me. Look, I'm your father, but I'm human as well. Mm -hmm. I make mistakes, mm -hmm. but my mistakes shouldn't be your mistakes. And my mistakes shouldn't give you a reason to define me like a person who's failed. I want you to be your own man, look at my positives, forget my negatives. Thereby, um, kind of preparing them for the eventuality that, look, you're growing up and you realize that I'm, 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 I'm human mm. and I'm not Superman like you thought when you were a baby. Yeah. So I want you to form a character of your own. This is the whole span of identity. Because before puberty, they are looking at um, you and they want to be everything you are. Right after this stage, the, it begins to become shaky, you know. Mm. So then, that's when I give them the leap. Now, start forming a character of your own. Who do you want to be? Okay? I helped you get to this level. I have some good attributes that you can emulate. I have some bad attributes, uh, bad things. Mm -hmm. Forget about them. Mm. Who do you want to be? And slowly going through that, I believe it's, it becomes then helpful. When they get into their 20s, they are much more prepared and they appreciate where life the journey has taken them, mm -hmm. who the man in their life has been to them, mm -hmm. and what kind of influence he has been to them, whether this man has made mistakes or not. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's the same approach that I've also taken into my work in terms of the, uh, the programs that I design, because I primarily do, do I design programs like that, social pro social development program. Yeah. So I take this whole, my, whatever experience with my children, or whatever experience with my work, I take home. I take whatever experience with my children, I take into my work. The conversations I have with my sons, I use that to mm. improve my work. Because yeah. the certain things, uh, for instance, um, one time I was talking to my children, uh, my, 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 I normally have these camps at my house when I'm in Uganda, and mm -hmm. all my... Uh, sometimes my uh, relatives, uh, sons, they come and, you know, I have one or two days and we're just talking about all these issues, me and the boys. Wow. I actually had one last night. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So in some of these conversations, I realized one thing that uh, was happening, that this generation of young people know a lot more information than we do. So it's wrong to assume, oh, they're innocent, or oh, they don't know anything. <laughs> no. They know so much stuff that if you're not careful, you know, they could be educating you. Most likely, I, I, got, I, got, I get schooled on so many things <laughs> by my own children. So I've learned to learn from how they're addressing their own challenges right now. Because mm -hmm. their challenges are different from my when I was growing up. Yeah. So I asked them, so if you find this and this, how do you go about it? And when they give me this information, then I use that to design programs that can address much more, at a larger scale, younger people, their age group. Because the challenges now are different. Yeah. We never had so much access to social media mm -hmm. and access to information in a snap. Yeah, right there. Yeah, you here. know. Mm -hmm. We never had that. <laughs> you know, we, 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 we actually relied on peers and friends. Now they can get information from anywhere. But the most important thing, and I tell even my friends who are parents, that don't block children from using the internet because the more you block, the more inquisitive they become and they can access it anywhere, anyway. Prepare them to analyze information that they come across by instilling values in them to know that this is not for me and this is for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of way that I think I would go to most parents, mm -hmm. but I would really still say the role of um, young boys preparing male, the male child primarily should fall within the shoulders of the men, mm. primarily, because they would clearly be able to prepare them for um, most of the situations that their mothers may not necessarily do. I like what you said earlier on about sometimes when you get on the ground, community yeah. level, the solutions are there. Yeah. And I think even for this, because the reality is there are a lot more homes now mm. that may not have you know, a father figure. Yeah. But whether it's through schools, programs, mentorship programs, yes. or community level, I think men can do a lot more to just basically, you know how women yeah. sometimes you're yeah. like, uh, you know, you just take all these little tricks under your wing. Exactly. Yeah, I think yeah. the men can do the same. Yeah. yeah. And it's very possible because like on, um, I have a WhatsApp group with my friends here and uh, we've been talking about this. Of course, we haven't pulled it off yet, but um, mm. 
if one of your friends you're in a group i know most most young people most people these days have uh, you know groups that they are on social media yeah they have they interact if one of you is has this special skill or experience in dealing with raising up young men you, could, you don't even have to go to school for that you could just be a good father figure and you're there for your son mm. share that with your friend's sons as well mm -hmm. or your your uh, single parent mother you know sons as well mm. for instance if you have uh, a friend who's a single mother and put them together you know organize you know we do so many things organize mm. you know weekends get the boys together talk about these rules age segregation okay making sure that you know you're talking to 18 16 17 year olds mm. alone from the 12 11 because yeah. it's different messages Very that different. Give. <laughs> yeah. yeah so we can do a lot more by helping each other mm. um before in our parents generation they had this community you know we are communal children yeah everyone will play a role in bringing you up now we don't have that anymore. Now we have to create that. Now we have to create that. And luckily we have the, you know, the social media age mm -hmm. where we can actually do that. And I see many things get organized on social media. We can use that still and come together for that good cause. Yeah. Because we have that as a responsibility. Mm -hmm. Unless we do that, which it's going to be much more difficult in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, in your time, I mean, you've done a lot of work in development. Yeah. Like you said before, it was mostly targeted towards the youth, but now you've crossed over. You work with women and gender-based violence programs. Um, in all the different places you've lived and communities, what are the things that stand out the most for you in terms of, even as an individual, to live like a full life? Well, <laughs> I know that's a big question, right? That's a huge one. <laughs> because, I mean, uh, when you were chatting, you said one yeah. of the things that you realize now is so important is like quality time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, things uh, that now, you know, maybe you didn't know 20 years yes. ago. I, for a start, I think um, for me, it's the most important thing for me is uh, family. Mm -hmm. You know, um, everything that I do. Because that's what we thrive for at the, at the end of the day. And um, before, you know, being younger, you know, the exciting career, moving the whole world and doing so many things. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I had my kids a bit earlier. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't so much in their lives growing up, you know, in their before 10 years, you know, I wasn't so much available. So um, my big a uh, game changer is recently when I realized that um, I need to spend more time with my children. Uh, when I got um, the uh, the posting where I am currently, because it gave me a chance to spend more time with them, I, I, I learned that the value of actually time well spent with family. Because uh, with that time, you could be able to cover so much you could be able to heal so many wounds you could be able to save and salvage so many situations connect you know emotionally intellectually and also create this kind of um, support system around each other just by sitting with my children having dinner every day and talking about different things I realize how close I came to them as my friend. I, I talk to them as my peers sometimes. Because then we engage in, you know, debates on anything. We, mm -hmm. we, we'll talk about stuff, we'll have an argument about politics, we'll talk about, um, you know, social life, anything. Mm. And, and, and that's, that's something that you can't take for granted. And you may not even have that with the friends you grew up with, because each one is now with their own family, yeah. you know, so you may not have that time. So uh, time with family has for me been um, the biggest thing that I feel is more important mm -hmm. and that I could, you know, it's priceless, uh, that could never go away. But I've also learned that uh, you also need to have time for yourself. I mean, it's that. Because yeah. one thing, and this is especially for, uh, for women, most times mothers, while growing, while raising their children, they devote their whole lives to their children. Yeah. Well-being, you know, you're taking care of the children, you're making sure they're ready for school and all of that. But as the children grow older, they start looking for their own place. Yeah. And then less time with you. So sometimes 
most women will find themselves with this, you know, vacuum. You know, my kids have all grown up and w what's happening to me? Mm. And you've not before created that moment where you're like, I need to take a moment and just do the thing. Reading a book, if I love uh, going out and, you know, doing some sightseeing, if I love doing painting as a passion, I, I, I stopped doing that because I had kids. Mm -hmm. And I can't do that again now because the kids have gone, you know, the passion has died out. So don't don't lose don't touch, lose touch with, that. with your passion with the things that make you happy as an individual because these kids will grow up and leave you mm -hmm. and you you'll have an empty vacuum life yeah. you know that could also uh, not be could be very depressive so I, I follow your passion love and continue loving what you do that makes you happy mm -hmm. spend time with family mm -hmm. value that most importantly and yes and uh, number one humility that's for me that's my life mantra yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's been my life mantra and i'll always and that do that applies in every aspect of yes. our lives yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, brian <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> pleasure having you on the show and sharing your experience and your values basically thank you All thank right. you very much Christo. <laughs> it's a real big honor and uh wishing you the best of 2020. you too yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you